my name is Laura Terrell. Um, my background is actually 18 years as a French teacher, um, all levels K-12, and then 10 years of supervision. Then in, in that interim, I was on different boards and got pretty active, and then my husband was asked to move to Puerto Rico. I had to go to Puerto Rico. It was hardship duty. That's the way the business previewed it. I had a pool in my backyard. It was terrible. So then I moved back. I taught French again. I got involved with Star Talk. I've been with them since the first year. And so that's sort of why I'm here. I'm a team leader. But right now, I'm also working part time with NFLC. So it's, it's great that you all got up so early in the morning. Give yourselves a round of applause for that. As someone who was up drinking with her son until midnight last night, let's hope I get through this. But um, so this is on lesson planning, lesson design. Star Talk will, of course, post the PowerPoint to the uh, Star Talk site, but it is already posted to my own wiki space. And if you're looking at the handout that has the lesson plan on it, you can see that my mission, if you were at the keynote yesterday and now, is to give sample lesson plans since we are asking all programs to use them, then you've got my wiki space. And if StarTalk takes a while to put it up and you want it right away, at least you can go and get it. So you have that information. What we're going to be doing today is looking at the various aspects of lesson planning. And the reason that I decided I love teaching, on top of all the other good reasons for loving teaching, is that it's like this complicated puzzle. And there was no way I was ever going to get bored because every day was different. And when I went into administration, the year became very repetitive. And it actually started to get a little boring. But as long as the, the students are changing, the lessons change, the content changes, it's refreshing to sit down and really think about everything that you see on the screen, some more, some less. So for about a half hour, we're going to be looking at some of these things from the theory standpoint. And then for the last hour, we're going to be engaging in different activities. First and foremost, even though I am going to demonstrate in English, everything that I showcase would be done in the target language in class. And at any point where you want to say, but how would you do that in the target language? Because that's what yesterday's audience asked. I will stop, switch over to French for a couple of minutes, act like a fool, and show you what I would do. Now, don't do that too often, because the cameras are rolling, and Brian will blackmail me. You need a strategy from day one. Whatever your strategy is going to be, you have to set the climate for a target language only classroom, no matter the age. So this is what I use middle school, high school students, um, but something has to happen. I taught my students on day one to say, may I speak English? Puis-je parler anglais? Puis-je parler français? So they had those two statements. They would ask permission, because you can't stop students from blurting out in English. They get curious. They want to know. Boom, out comes the English. So what this gives you is that timeout moment. Timeout. It's posted on the wall. You point to it. You make them say, may I speak English? Puis-je parler anglais? And because you're so nice, you smile and you say, no. <laughs> so you've stopped the English. But you mentally, as a teacher, have made note that there's a question in the room. Because actually, the question was already asked. Giving you a chance to act out again, restate, rephrase, make it comprehensible. The trick is, you have to ask permission also. So they get to interrupt you if you forget and use English. And let me tell you, they will never give you permission to use English once you have denied them permission. So create that climate using the target language. And the second part of that is making it comprehensible. So again, see, I always put my grandson in, but you can see he's grown up. Because here he was two. Do you really think that my grandson, as bright as he is, as all of our grandchildren are, can read that book? Does he look like he's interested? Yes. So what is making this book at age two capture his interest? Pictures. Pictures. So if you teach a novice class and you don't have a lot of images, you have no hope of hooking them, interesting them, or staying in the target language. 
Because when you think about it, how many of you have young children at home or grandchildren? It's the picture books, right? What happens if there's too many words on the page of a book when a child is two, three, four years old? What does that child do? It's universal. <laughs> they turn the page. Not only do they turn the page, if you try, because this is what we try to do, we try to stop them from turning the page, right? So we can finish reading the words. Well, if you try to stop a child from turning the page, the page is going to get ripped, right? So what do you learn as a parent to do, or a grandparent? You shorten the amount that you read. You read the picture. You stop trying to read every word on the page. And once a child finds a book they really like, what do they want you to do? Read it over and over and over again. Why? They didn't understand it the first time. So if you kind of put in your brain what first language children do, and remember that for those of you that teach novice or are training teachers to teach novice, that's what you have to make sure they understand, that it is that constant repetition. I suggested to new teachers that I trained when I was a supervisor that we laminated this, they had a card, and I asked them to keep it visible as they taught so that when they knew they were getting tempted to go back into English, they could glance and think, oh, maybe a gesture, maybe a visual. I'm not going to go over every one of those because in this room you know what they all mean. It's just that in the moment when you have students in front of you, you forget all the things that are at your disposal to try to make text comprehensible. Authentic text is what we want to use. The biggest issue is always, where do I find it? We'll talk about that in a minute. But what do you think this text is about? And if you read French, do not volunteer. Based on the image, because that's what your brain processes first, what do you think the text is about? A new way of tying shoelaces. Did you need French to understand that? Now, we do have some cognates, so Chinese teachers are saying, well, that's great for French, but that doesn't work in Chinese. But even without understanding Chinese, I'm halfway there on the image alone. And then as a teacher, I can start to make connections. I'll give you some more examples. But what you've done by choosing real, a real text, an authentic text, is it's real world. It showed up in a French newspaper, or I wouldn't have it, or it showed up online. It talks about the culture. Something is changing in France. And it has a models of correct language. So, and if a French teacher would say, but that's wrong, that's interesting, because that's the way the French wrote it. So sometimes we're more pure than the actual target language speakers themselves. This is actually telling you that an invention has been crowdsourced funded in France for a new way to tie our shoelaces using magnets, because it'll be a lot safer in the long run when you're running and such not to have to worry. And moms everywhere are going to jump in, up and down for joy, because now you know shoelaces are pretty much going to disappear. So novice text has to have, according to Actful, strong visual support. You don't have a visual to go with your text. You have to create it. You find a great text that you want to use, and there are no visuals with it, you have to go and get the images or find them. Because that's why we use picture books in first language. So your lesson is going to be based on authentic text. Anyone want to make a guess that doesn't speak French as to what this image is about? Pardon me, say that again. Some kind of ceremony because of the way they're dressed. It does look ceremonial. Anything else that you would just guess? Now, for those of you that have speakers that have a little more language, this prediction of what the reading is going to be about is a very good strategy before you even read it. But what it's basically saying, it's great for a family unit because this is two dads who happen to be sumo wrestlers holding up their babies to see how loudly they cry. 
And the tradition in the Shinto is that the louder the baby cries, the healthier they are. They're not torturing their babies. So if you're raising a child at home right now and they cry loudly, just say, oh, that's good. They're really healthy. If you have trouble, how many of you have trouble finding authentic text? Anyone in here? Here is my best tip for you. Google is, a, is just a godsend. Somebody asked me, what was the biggest change when you went back into the classroom after 10 years out? Technology, access of materials, no need to carry a suitcase back from a French-speaking country anymore. I had what I needed right on the internet. Go to Google. This is what I do to find Chinese resources. Google Translate. I know that yesterday it was a little bit disparaged, but I think it's a tool and we should use it for when it works. Type in your phrase you want, hit Mandarin Chinese, hit Hindi. I don't know, what, now I'm lost. I have no idea what those characters say, but I copy them, I paste them into Google, I click, I get a web page, all the text stuff is right here, I ignore it. I click on images or video and I usually find something that will work for my workshops and trainings for different languages. So if you search in the target language and you click on images, you click on video, well that means that behind every image is a Chinese website. So if the image looks interesting or looks like it's designed for children, then I probably have something in text that I might be able to use. Now, first of all, in an American school, can I use this image? I teach K-12 in the United States. Can I take this image into my classroom? Well, I guess, you know, please know your school board, but in the majority of schools in the United States of America today, you will not take anything in that mentions alcohol in any way, size, shape, or form, hence increasing their interest in anything that they can't access. So. I just wanted to point that out. And so, but what if I find this text and I think, wow, I want to use it? Well, then I just draw a box on it, shade it in, and cover up the drink. Now, this is Italian. Does anybody in here speak Italian? Then you may not participate for a moment. Because what I want to ask the audience is, what do you understand about this image? Turn to your partner just for a second and talk about what do you understand as a non-Italian speaker? What are the things you know it's saying? Able to follow along at all with the presentation. Can you hear okay? It says olive. So ingredients on this side. Necessary to, to reduce the calories. How many minutes is needed to burn that much? By a 60 kg for some Okay, so could you call a few out? Yeah, that's right. What do you understand? Could you share a couple of things that you were saying to your partner? We thought um, on the left side it shows ingredients. Okay, so left side we've got food and ingredients. Then in the middle what else? column it's calories. Okay, calories, let somebody else go. We <laughs> never want to let a superstar dominate during our lesson. So it's very important not to always take volunteers. We're going to talk about that in a minute. And I think these last two columns have to do with how much you'd have to run or something to burn off. Okay, you so ate. you're thinking something to yeah. run or burn to off move. And it calories. depends on how much you weigh. It depends on how much you weigh. So did anybody go a little bit further with those two columns about how much you weigh? A woman and man. A man and a woman. Yeah. Okay, so yeah. we always hear that men lose weight more quickly. This sort of starts to explain a little bit about why. <laughs> what, anything else? Uh, 300 calories, how much they need, like how, many, how much exercise they need to do to burn right. that. Right, you're just not going to enjoy that dessert as much if you have this in front of you. I think that's the next step for McDonald's. You post the calories and then you post how many hours you have to work out to burn them off and that might be the one that trips us all into eating healthy, right? Is this cultural? What is cultural about this text? What have you learned about the Italians just by looking at this text? Let me give you an example. First and foremost, they like to drink. Okay, what else? And there's olive. They eat similar wait, wait. foods. They eat similar foods to us. They're interested in the calorie intake and then 
how much it takes to reduce them. I thought it was only them. Americans that had this issue with fast food and calories. And sometimes we culturally convey that that's the case, but then if you go and read the world reports on childhood obesity, you realize it's not just the United States. They wouldn't be publishing this in an Italian newspaper unless they had some concerns about poor eating habits. Anything else cultural in this text? Mm -hmm. the, the Italians are doing it more because it's not calories, it is kilocalories. Well, the, the, there it's how do you report this. It's that metric system that is up there both for weight and for calories. So we've got the measurement coming in in context. And so there's a lot in this text that comes in. Did you understand every aspect of this text? No. And so this is where I'm saying that I as a teacher may have to, even though this text is visual, I may have to be prepared with more visuals to make it comprehensible as an instructional tool so that I can point to this and say, como dit-on, how do you say? And you can be looking for that new word in the text. Otherwise, I'm going to be tempted to point to the word and let you tell me what it means in English. And if you ever allow translation of an authentic text, you're in trouble. It's a slippery slope because they start to believe they need to understand every word to process a text. That's a very dangerous message. So here's how that would play out with French as examples and English there only so when you go back and look at this slide, if you care to, you can see what I would be doing instructionally in class. So I would be asking the question, comment dit-on, how do you say, comment dit-on? And you would go into the text and find that word for to burn. Or comment dit-on, because to walk is not an obvious cognate even for an English speaker going into, into Italian or Spanish. So this would help you find it. This is common core strategies. So if you are working with a principal that's saying to you, you need to be teaching literacy in your class, this is teaching literacy. This is predicting meaning of words out of context. So you're actually able to do serious literacy strategies even at the novice level. Or um, using circumlocution, I'm going to go to this fourth one, something yellow that goes with a hamburger. Quelque chose qui est jaune, qui va avec un hamburger. Could you pick that word out now? You would pick out what word? Those of you that can read up here. Formaggio. Formaggio. Something that is white, that, so that you're trying to get them to identify vocabulary, not with a list of words in the target language and in English, because they're not going to learn the words as efficiently as I did in Puerto Rico when there was no one helping me out with English. So we can do it, but we can only do it if we are highly prepared to do it. How many of you have seen this image before? Hmm, enough, well, at least one person at every table. So then turn at your table, talk to that person next to you, and explain what you can of this image. Put up a couple more words at your table before I start talking about it. Give yourselves a minute to talk it over. Teaching you do in the beginning, uh -huh. and then there comes a down, down, uh, it's down yeah, time. Down so, time. whatever you want to teach, you want to give them new vocabulary, new topic. So, do it at the first 10 minutes of the class, and then they give them some tasks to do it, maybe because that is the downtime. Uh -huh. And then again, um, they have some, uh, you know, or some time to. Uh, grasp again yes. so, Before, so you can end the lesson with uh, assessment gotcha. so that's it. and that's like for a 20-minute lesson or is this okay okay so in an actual classroom setting right now I would not choose to call on a volunteer if I had not had all those cameras right there, I would have been walking around the room fanning myself with my index cards. So I'm fanning myself with my index cards because you all know that all your names are on them. And so as I'm walking by fanning myself with an index card, 
I'm putting a little stress into your life because you know that this means I'm going to call on someone. It's not going to be a volunteer. It's not going to be the person that raises their hand because when we call on the volunteers in our classroom, we get a skewed impression of learning. And especially in our Star Talk programs, where we might have a heritage student or two in the room, we can really get a skewed impression of learning. So by doing this, you all should have an answer because the two of you were talking. So even if you had no clue what this visual was, you could simply report what she said to you. I don't really even care if it's right or wrong at this point. The idea is that you have something to say because you were just practicing it. In the classroom, it might look more like this. I'll show you a picture. How many things can you say about the picture? Talk it over. Make sure that everyone can say something about the picture, not so much content. So let's see. Hmm, whom would I like to pick on? Because their name's on the card. Sir, in the back, I noticed you were goofing off. Oh, don't look around like that. I noticed that you were goofing off a little bit because my finger got on his card. Would you mind sharing something you and your partner were talking about? Sure. Um, so this is sort of like the time through a class. And so the, the most optimal time for a student to perhaps like learn something new would be at the beginning time, the prime time for learning. But then there's like a certain amount of time that they wear out and so they need a little bit of downtime. Perfect. And that's exactly the type of image. Now, it, now once I called on two or three people as non-volunteers, then I would say anything else, allowing that overachiever who always wants to talk to come into the conversation, but not until I've called on non-volunteers. So is there anything else you'd like to throw in that you were talking about? Anyone? It's because of your camera crews that they don't want to volunteer, you see. But here's the truth of the matter. When you show an image, you want your students to talk about it first. Even in teacher prep, this is a teacher prep example, you want them to activate prior knowledge. You want to hear what comes out of their mouths before you go into lecture mode. You can correct misconceptions that way. So you want them talking before you, and you're exactly right. What we know because of the research done on the brain is that when we attach those electrodes to the brain, when, when learners come into the room, their brains are bright red. If you teach, anyone teach high school year round? Middle school? Elementary? There's no doubt that they have the most energy when they come into the room because you've got to settle them down. But that also means it's prime learning time. So you are always saying, what is the most important thing in the lesson do it first. And a lot of times we do administrivia first. We take attendance, we do homework checks, we make announcements, we do all the wrong things. We waste prime learning time. Also, your teachers need to know that no matter how good they are, they are those brains are dimming. This is a cycle in the brain. Our brains are not capable, biologically, of paying constant attention. They're not capable of it. The, the research shows that. So it's nice to tell a beginning teacher that it's not their fault. This is just going to happen, but how do you deal with it? Well, that's called downtime. I've been teaching, teaching, teaching. Downtime means turn and talk. It doesn't mean goof off. It means you're not learning at your best right now, so why would I be working so hard? I need to take a minute to listen to you do something. And I'm going to show you a lesson based on this. And then the most challenging piece is to find out if everyone in my class has learned it. What is that activity that I design so that when you all walk out, out of the door, I feel like each individual student has learned the skill, not just a few? Because if I send you out without having learned it, there's no more go home and study mentality. That would be nice, but when you teach a sequential discipline, you cannot count on it. And if some study at home and some don't, the gaps widen and you have a nightmare. And so you've created the nightmare, not them, you, because you have to plan for this learning cycle. Anyone teaching uh, young children? So do you know what happens to this 20-minute cycle for a young child? Right. So if your learner is six years old, their attention span does not exceed six minutes. But the cycle is the same. 
It's still input, downput, and then a little bit fresh. So that means that when we design our lessons, we attend to, not perfectly, but we attend to this concept that is often called in elementary, I do, we do, you do, or the gradual release of responsibility that is now on the um, star talk at a glance. Very, very important that we attend to this for learning to occur. And this has been a hardship for a lot of us like me that like to talk and do everything. It really is because we're a skill. All skills are learned the same way. They are learned by, first you have to have some input, because think about my son when he went out on the baseball field in Little League the first time, anyone that raised a child that did this, they send him out there, they're in the outfield, they give him a glove, I don't know why, they're not gonna use it, because they go out there and the game's boring and they start kicking the dirt. They could care less what's going on, but now they're on the field and the coach starts working with them. It's just like band. Okay, I've got you in my class. You can't play a note to save your soul, but I'm going to start getting you to play something. And then we're going to go perform it for the parents, and gradually you're going to be a solo, a soloist. Now, if anyone has actually had a student in band, have you? If you've had a child in band in U.S. schools, as a parent, you go to the spring concerts. You do not go for the quality of the music. In a skill, there's no such thing as perfection early on. So if you're trying to make your novice learners sound perfect, you're trying to move them from learning to soloist immediately. And it doesn't happen in any skill. So perfection comes with time. So we want to really think about that. And this is the last little piece of theory. How much can you learn at one time? This is frightening. Think about a vocabulary list, a typical vocabulary list coming from a textbook. So for some of you, that's a college book. For some of us, it's high school books. How many words are in a chapter? on a vocab list usually? 100 or more. How long do you spend on that chapter? Hmm, three weeks, four weeks. But the research shows that a genius older than 14 can only learn nine new items at a time. A genius. Most of us are not teaching classrooms full of geniuses. And a word is an item. Furthermore, 20 times in context to learn the word. A little later on, we're going to talk about vocabulary instruction and repeating after me. But this is a very scary statistic. When you're writing your curriculum template and you're thinking about how many words the learners are going to learn in a three-week program and retain, almost all of you are going to put way too many words. So shorten it. We would much rather them remember what they learn in the three weeks, five weeks later, than have you throw way too much at them. So I would also talk to you, how many of you supervise or in lead instructor roles? So if you're in lead instructor roles, this becomes important, and that is the transition. What keeps students from switching to English when you change activities? Because isn't that normal behavior? Yeah. Any time we had a transition in the plenary in the afternoon, we turned and talked. Somebody else was walking up on stage, you turn and comment. Well, the younger they are, the more off task they go. So you could refer back to this. But what I want to do, that really is the end of the theory. This is your Apple save moment. Because every 20 minutes, and we're at about 35 now, I need to stop and give you processing time. So if you had colleagues that slept in this morning, for shame on them, but what two things would you want to tell them that you've heard this morning that you're still pondering, you want to think about, or you're taking back to your programs? Don't turn and talk yet. Thinking is a silent activity. What two things, try to jot down two words real quickly. Two things, just think about what we've been saying. Do not turn and talk. Now 
Now this is what I would do in my high school classes. They thought I was crazy. When you have your two things, would you please put your hand on your head? Now I noticed how quickly Jane put her hand on her head. So while the rest of you are still working, I'm coming over to Jane and letting her start whispering to me. And the reason I'm doing that is because a high school student will put their hand on their head and be thinking about the hot football game. <laughs> but if they know that hand on head means I know you're ready to share, they're not putting their hand on their head just to pretend that they've got an answer. <laughs> so now if you've seen that your partner has written something, would you turn and talk? Talk over the couple of things that are most important to you. And remember, I have my index cards in my hand. And this is really, would be really easy for them to understand, yes. especially yes. my Russian, yes. Russian speakers who know, who always you know, live in a culture where everybody's trained to play an instrument. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then I really liked the um, part where she talked about getting the non-volunteers to participate. I like that one too. Yeah, because you always have the one, you know, and the ones who always raise their hands and not asking them first. So I thought that was a good strategy. Another one she mentioned about how to use authentic text. Yes. Because it's yes. really difficult, especially for Chinese yes. language. Yes. So we, when we find an authentic text, it's too hard. But yes. we also want to, we still want to use that. So but when the visual ed teachers do some work, prepared work, and get visual ed support, it really helps kids to feel yeah. they are able to read the yeah. authentic text like native speakers. Yeah. We have the same thing so, with Russian, too, because of the script. And, yeah. yeah. So, so I think that's a really good way. Like, somehow we can forget. We can get the authentic text. Yeah. Yeah. So I said about <laughs> if you could wrap up those thoughts, and I know I'm not giving you much she time. She showed us how to break down complex images or segments of text with more, with more pictures. OK, so who would be willing to share? I'm breaking my own rule. It really would be far more effective instructionally to call on non-volunteers. But we're a collaborative group. Who would like to volunteer? I just want you to notice what just happened. The confident person's hand went up right away, which I'm so glad you did that. I'm trying to pick on you. But that is exactly what happens in the classroom. She's making a case for why I keep saying you cannot call on volunteers. But we can. What would you like to say? <laughs> well, I learned that for novice level, I should be using a lot of visuals. A lot of visuals at the novice level. What else? I think with the visuals, the way you showed to break down a more complex body of text with more visuals was really good. Even breaking down a visual mm -hmm. text with even more visuals. Mm -hmm. What else? I loved the analogy, or the reminder that learning a language is like learning any skill. So I imagine talking to my Russian novice teachers and using the instrument analogy because they all... Okay, and another thing I used to do with my high school students was they had to bring in an analogy to a skill they were learning in their own lives. Oh, so they had to equate French with learning soccer, equate French with learning guitar, or and they had to bring in images and show what this was like. Because you know what? A child understands that to be a good soccer player, they go to practice every day for two hours. A parent understands that to learn a musical instrument, you start them young, and you give them private lessons, and they practice every day for the rest of their lives. And it's not until they get to senior high and they do the senior high band concert that you enjoy the music. You don't enjoy middle school concerts. But somehow in language, whether it's the Rosetta Stone I mentioned yesterday or the Berlitz of old, Americans have this notion that they're supposed to be able to learn a language overnight. And we have to do something to make it understood by the, young, by the young people in our classrooms that this is just like learning to cook. This is like learning to dance. But somehow we don't get that across. So I'm really glad you brought that up. What else? Mm -hmm. Time. It's very important to know when to start and it's most important to know when to stop to give the students a break. So to think of what that primacy recency research is showing us. Anything else or any questions that you have about 
anything before we go into more direct examples. I have a question actually because I'm, uh, you know, I've worked with some people that, you know, if you make any changes to the authentic material, like adding more visuals or something, <laughs> that it's no longer authentic and you shouldn't use it. What would you, how would you respond? Well, what I would do is I would ask them in their culture if they do what we do in the United States. So we have our classics of literature. Let's just take the one I bought for my grandson the other day, Moby Dick. Do you think I went out and bought the original version of Moby Dick for a four-year-old? No. But do you know that Moby Dick has been written down? You know, we have those great classics of literature that are abbreviated and shortened, and they put some pictures in even. And then we have the comic strip version. And then we have the board book version. And I actually bought him something just beyond the board book version that had a lot of pictures and maybe only 100 words in the text. So we adapt for youth in any culture by giving more visuals. We can't necessarily find the adapted text that they're using over there for their four and five-year-olds. <coughs> so I don't think it's bad to add visuals. What I do think is bad is if you write the English on the side. That's not playing fair. But adding more visuals is something we do naturally in all languages to make text more comprehensible. There's a reason that the Italians chose to put that into, well, that's not good, that chose to put that text into, um, hold on, what am I supposed to do now? Cancel, cancel, cancel. Maybe, if that happens again, just let me know that I have to go and do that. It's probably because my um, wireless is on. But that, it's just a natural thing. So I would try to explain to them that way, that they actually do it in first language. What's the alternative? Making up non-authentic text? Which is better? Further adapting an authentic text or making up non-authentic stuff? I mean, it, those are your two choices, really. I saw somebody in the back. Were you going to say something back there? No? no? OK. Uh, I have a question. What do you think about using the English letters uh, in helping the students learning how to pronounce the words, especially if, if the language is not uh, English letters? Say well, in Chinese, pinyin, I mean, there's research that shows we should use pinyin initially. Now, the younger they are, the less they need it. But the older they are, they need to see the romanization. And also because in most languages, you use romanization to type, to keyboard which is the way most non-native speakers will write in the language. They'll write on a keyboard. So that, for that purpose. And then take it away as soon as you can. So I don't want to ask too many questions about things we haven't talked about yet, because I'm still going to give more examples. OK, so um, let's look at the lesson plan that I'm going to introduce right now, and I'll talk about that in just a second. So we have a, I wrote a lesson plan for you. I'm going to refer to it as we go through a little bit. But our lesson plan is backward design. In order to teach a mini lesson in here, and I'm going to do two of them, I had to know what my goals were for the lesson. And I chose to do one on a city. And the reason I picked city is because obviously, I apologize, I can't do all of your languages, but I know from going to Star Talk programs and reading templates that many of us visit other cities. We do something with a city in another culture. So I thought if nothing else, you could just get some ideas about city that you might be able to use as a cross-cultural lesson plan. So I had to go into my stage one, and I told you that I'm writing a lesson plan for 60 minutes. Star Talk says a lesson plan should probably not be written for more than 90 minutes because we think it's, I think, it's very hard to write your goals and your stage two for all day. You have to chunk it down. So to do more than one lesson plan is easier for me. But if you feel differently, talk to your team leader. So my goals for this lesson, there are three bullets there. One is to identify locations in cities. Sounds like something we could do. We'll look at it. One is to state preferences for things you like to do. And you notice recycle is next to that. Because a good lesson always thinks about how to bring in yesterday's material, but not as review. Just as an extension, adding on, building. And another is just to do some matching, because this is the first day on some of this vocabulary. So it's just going to be interpretive 
Do you hear what I'm saying? Can you show me you understand the words? And how am I going to assess that? And that's why we told program yesterday we're requiring stage one and stage two. Because how do you even begin to teach if you don't have stage one and stage two? Stage three, good teachers can kind of walk their way through without writing it all out. But stage one and stage two are really important. So this lesson is going to focus around what is the ideal city. And almost all of you have a city that's near and dear to your hearts. True. You have a city you would like to talk about. You have a city you'd like to go look up online and see what's available. For me in France, that city is Angers because I studied there. So it was, it was pleasurable to go back and look at Angers and read about it and find images. And so we're talking about cities near beaches, cities near, this is this unit. The cities in China that I want to make them aware of are the cities that we're going to visit on this short tour of India. I look for images that I think will capture them. So I can't show images that capture my attention. I'm 60. I have to try to think like a 14-year-old. This is challenging. But so when I saw something, just to give you a sense of what you're doing, geocaching? Geocaching? Oh, OK. This is cool. This is a cognate. I'm getting this one because I know there's something I can do with it. And I'm just going to show them images. And I might just start with these without even reading them and say, is Angers interesting or not interesting? That's it. One picture at a time. Interessant? Non interessant. Pas interessant. That's all. Just look at it. I'm trying to build your interest. When I do this unit, your template, I have to know my goals. For the three weeks, four weeks that you were working on this curriculum template, I need to be able to tell the students in English what the goals of the unit are. And today, we're working on identify places in a city. But at the beginning of the unit, that's that lingua folio concept. They've got to know the goals. Now, high school students can deal with yes, with some help, not yet. Elementary, you might want to create something you can stamp, making it cuter, more attractive, put stickers on it. Although having taught high school for many years, they are into stamps and stickers. So do not necessarily think you have to go all serious on them. They really are not adults. And I can prove it to you. How many of you have teenagers at home? or teenagers recently enough that you remember what it was like? Did you, as a parent, think of your teenager in high school as an adult? Not anywhere near it. So, but when we send them off to school, teachers often look at those bodies and say, adult. But the parents are saying, hmm, no way are they ready to leave home, right? I mean, first year of college is a disaster for many kids for that reason. So are your goals smart? It is possible to write an excellent goal, and it will not be a smart goal. I'm going to give you an example, and it's probably going to offend. I would like for you to go to the restaurant, participate in the typical restaurant scene, and be able to order and pay for food and have that conversation. Smart goal? Depends. Are you thinking that one student will be the server and the other student will be the customer? If that's what you're thinking, then it's not a smart goal. Why? Why is it not smart to have a 14-year-old learn the lines of the server? Are they going to use them? No. No, so it's not smart. What if I'm working on clothing and co this type of thing? What if I'm saying, what color is her sweater? My goal was to be able to name colors and clothing. Is this a smart goal to be able to ask and answer this question? What color is her sweater? Smart? No. Because the only way I ever ask that question in real life is if I'm colorblind. And I won't ask you. I'll ask her, what color are you wearing today? I'm never going to walk up to somebody and say, what is she wearing? <laughs> now, if I had switched that to, what are you going to wear to the party on Friday night, and you can hear it being done on the streets, it's a smart goal. So that's a challenge. You really have to think about your goals. A lot of textbooks write goals that are not smart. So what will you do, say, right, 
that you could do say right on the streets of Beijing, now you've got a smart goal. If it's do say right just to do say right, then it's not a smart goal. What if I said my smart goal was to count to 20? Students will be able to count to 20. Smart goal? Thumbs up, thumbs down. Count to 20. Smart goal or not? Got to commit. This is why you have people, students signal, because you know who's involved, who's goofing off. It is not a smart goal. How many times has someone in the United States walked up to you and said, count to 20, please? <laughs> Learning the numbers to 20 is important. But the context has to be real. Bargain in the market, et cetera, et cetera. Do math problems. Something has to make it smart. So my goal, my smart goal, is to have you identify places in the city. Because if you're talking over where you want to go on vacation, you might say, is there a museum? Is there a beach? Are there good restaurants? Blah, 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 blah. So you can hear yourself doing that out on the streets. And the way I, I like to train teachers to do this, but it's really tricky, so I want you to listen very closely, is to hear the conversation that you want your students to be able to have in real life in your head as you write that curriculum template. So, and the reason I say it's very important, hear the conversation, do not teach it. Because that's taking us back to teaching language from dialogues. But by hearing it in my head, I know what the question and sentence frames are that I need to teach so that by the end of the unit, they have a chance of putting together a real world conversation. Do you understand what I'm saying? In a minute, I'm going to chat. So for the lesson we're working on today, I'm working on things like, is there a beach? No. Yes, there is. No, there isn't. So I'm picking out an aspect of this eventual conversation to work on today. I'm using it as a teacher to guide my instruction. Now, that is so important to me that you heard that. Would you turn to your partner and say what you understood about what I said? Because if this is misunderstood, you could do horrible things. <laughs> so hear, hear the conversation. Do not teach the conversation. But pick out the pieces, the questions and answer frames that you need. Because what we've traditionally done, these are going to be places in a city, is I give you a list of vocabulary. It has 15 words on it of places in a city. And I teach you to say, library, museum, city hall, restaurant. Well, what can I do with those words? If that's all I've learned are the words. What am I supposed to do? Say, Denver, restaurant? <laughs> Denver, beach? Denver, mountain? No, I have to teach on day one, are there mountains in Denver? Are there good restaurants in Denver? It's not restaurant and mountain that's really useful out there. It becomes the pattern. So that's why when I'm doing my goals, I'm thinking what are the frames that they need? And I've actually listed them in that no section. Is there, are there? But I've also listed places typical to city but I thought through what's the sentence and question pattern. This is first language instruction. Brown bear, brown bear, what do you see? We didn't say that we were going to teach bear by itself and then what by itself. We just put the sentence frame out there, the question pattern. Brown bear, brown bear, what do you see? Are you my mother? Are you my mother? Are you my mother? The hungry, hungry caterpillar. On Monday he ate, on Tuesday he ate. We didn't try to just teach what he ate as isolated words. We put it always in that board book, picture book, into sentences immediately. And that's what your learners need from you at that novice level. So now I'm thinking like an assessor. What are you going to be able to do at the end of the lesson? You've got the lesson plan. We've looked at this. We're going to bring it together. You just walked into my classroom. I've written my lesson plan. I've looked at the 10 questions that Star Talk gives you. It's, I think it's a great lesson plan. You can critique it later, just like I told you yesterday. And as class starts, my number one responsibility is to capture your attention. 
because you have walked in thinking about a million other things. So I'm going to show this video without the sound because it doesn't have any words. And I want you to be thinking about words you know that your novice learners <coughs> might know that, you could, that come to your mind as you watch this. So it's very short. It's one minute. So as you're watching, they might be remembering words you taught yesterday, or maybe you've already taught activities, and now you're extending into something else. But most learners, unless it's day one of a novice class, will have some words in their brain. Maybe it's even just colors. Maybe it's weather. But you want to activate prior knowledge before you start teaching this video. So when we're talking about activating prior knowledge, what we're really saying is what vocabulary do you already know? At the novice level, prior knowledge is vocabulary. And so you make them feel good when they write their own list of vocabulary, they share their list with the person next to them. Maybe they can't write it in Chinese, they could take out a phone, and they could alternate saying it and recording it. So there's ways of getting it out. Then we go around the room and I hear what words and phrases and questions you already know. And I make a master list. Now I know what I have to teach. This I just have to recycle. But there are a few more words I want to teach or phrases. Now this is called a time lapse photography. How many of you have seen these before? There was an international competition to, for cities to do time lapse on their city, 24 hours in the life of. So almost every time I've gone to a city on YouTube, I've been able to find a time lapse video. And if it, there is language, all you have to do is mute it and just use the images. You can just completely, even if it's in English, like there's a great UNESCO video in Chinese on um, Dragon Boat Festival, uh, just turn off the English and the images are fabulous. So now we're easing into the lesson, and I'm getting ready to teach that first <coughs> new structure that I know they don't know how to say is there, are there. I know that. That's new. Mm -hmm. You had a question. And the question is because you said list words and phrases. Most of the students, like we get, this is Hindi language program in New York City Department of Education. And some like uh, Spanish students from Caribbean islands and Hispanic students, can they write in English and give us and we help them to know that word? I not, not. Because when you say, I'll write in English, it becomes a translation exercise. Right, I agree 100% So if they you. don't know any words, right. then you start from scratch, giving them mm -hmm. the words you want them to have. Okay. Now, let's say that I choose to teach 10 words with a city, mm -hmm. but you have a student who's passionate about a word I wasn't planning to teach. Okay. I want to make sure that they know how to use an online dictionary translator mm -hmm. so they can go and look it up. Because now the online dictionaries also usually have sound Particularly, even our speaker yesterday on Google said at the word level, they're great. At the word level, Google's great. So let them become in charge of their own words. But otherwise, it becomes translate, translate, translate. Yeah, we do not encourage, but what I'm saying, they want, if I show them this picture and they have a word like people, uh, train. The lesson becomes, how do I find out what that is right. on my own? On my own. So okay. your message is, sweep mm, on dictionnaire. I'm not a dictionary. So that tells me that they know not zero, and I have to take them there. Right. Thank mm -hmm. you. So, and you might hear that word and then work it into a future lesson. Absolutely. But not, don't become mm -hmm. a translator don't because accept. they'll do it to you all the time. Okay. They're just so nasty about that. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. So now, we're going to learn some new vocabulary, and I want to prove something very important to you. Repeat after me, does not work. So you have to play along here in French for just a minute. You've got the words up there. And I am going to have you say, there is a school. Okay, now I would not have translated that in the classroom, but I'm just saying that for you. Répétez après moi, il y a. Il y a. Il y a une école. Il y a une école. Répétez encore. Il y a une école. Avec votre partenaire, tournez. 
Now, how many of you felt that you could do it okay right after I said it? And how many of you found it was much harder to turn to your partner and say it? You can pair it without learning anything. So when you say repeat after me, repeat after me, repeat after me, nothing's happening in the brain. It's parody. Parrots learn to mimic. It's when they can turn and use it on their own that they've started to acquire it. So hence this design of one by one, looking at the picture, a real picture of a school in Angers. Very slow paced. How many words can I teach a day in that 20 minute segment? Older students? It was five to nine, seven's average. So I'm gonna be showing you lots of pictures, but I certainly would not be teaching all these words in one day because you can, in one segment, because you cannot possibly learn them. But as we work with the pictures, maybe we go back to the video, we go back and expand our list on vocabulary, I know that you are beginning to acquire these words. And we're gonna do an activity. So if you will find the sheet of paper that should be on your table, this activity is called Tear Sheet Vocabulary. It's going to come up later, but I'm changing the order. Now, are there any type A people in the room? Because you're going to hate this activity. What you are going to do, you may crease it nicely if you must, but truly what I'd like you to do as quickly as possible is tear. And if any of you are such type A people that you have scissors with you and you get them out, I am going to embarrass you. So just tear the vocabulary as quickly as you can. Uh. And sure, there are some people in this room that would say, well, I will cut these all apart for my students, and I'll make them perfect, and um, I'll do all the work for them. And please, if a student can do it for themselves, don't you have better things to do? <laughs> you should be almost finished because I'm doing it while I am standing up and talking. And I only have three more to tear. So if you are not close to being finished, we have evidence that you are type A. And you are trying to make them far too neat. I'm finished. What about you? Yeah. Now, if you do this in your class, as they tear them, they should be absolutely quiet and they should be saying the words to themselves. So you're obvi and you could be walking around pointing to a picture, asking a student to say, il y a une, il n'y a pas deux, because that's what you've been teaching. There is, there isn't. So please finish. <laughs> and then when you finish, spread them out in front of you so that you're looking at all the pictures in any random order. And then you and your partner make sure you know what these words are in English, real quickly. And we're gonna do this in English, and since not everybody's a first language speaker, I've come to realize that it's hard. So we don't, I don't have to have a different language to do this in. Now, take a look and see who does not have theirs spread out yet and who's tearing them, and really work on their personality. You know, type A people have, type A people have more heart attacks, so you might want to consider letting go of some of that perfection. Okay, here's what we're gonna do. Whether you're ready or not, I'm very sorry. We're ready to play the game. I'm sorry some of you aren't. So you know what all those images are, right? And we could even just make sure, just to make it easier, while we give uh, our type A's a little bit longer. What's this word going to be? School. 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 Train station. Library. It's actually a bookstore. Yes. It's a bookstore. Swimming, Swimming pool. pool. Bridge. Bridge. A bridge, a river. Castle. A castle. The cafe, church, church or cathedral, market, market, market bakery, old house, old house old train, train, and maybe a train or a metro, you know, public transportation. There is one thing I wanted to point out and I forgot. It used to be when I taught Angers, this is what I focused on. They knew that Angers had a chateau. That's all I taught them. What impression I then gave my American students was that Angers was an old medieval city. 
But that 24-hour time-lapse video conveyed that Angers is a city just like Denver that happens to have a chateau. So I mean, it's really important that we not get into these stereotypes of our cities, go here to visit this really old thing. Because then they're left like, oh, that country is so out of it. You know, so. OK, now they're spread out in front of you. And I'm going to call this word in English. And as I call it, you'll pick up that piece of paper. And then you'll pick up the next one and just hold them in order, OK? All right, so I'm calling it in English, obviously, in the classroom. You're doing this in your target language. Ready? Mm -hmm. Cathedral or church, school, a museum, a Canadian restaurant. Oh, your pictures don't really match, do they? Sorry about that. Too bad, you're, you're geniuses. You can do it. A bridge or a river, a bookstore, a swimming pool, a castle, a beach, a train station, a cafe, and a bakery. Now, some of you made it. You picked them all up. And for some of you, it was much too fast, which is why you can do it more than once. Start slow, build in speed as they learn the words better. Very kinesthetic. You can see who is paying attention and who is not. And what you ask for is to call them back. So call back the correct order, everyone. Church, school, school museum, 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 restaurant, bridge, bridge, bridge or river, bookstore, bookstore, bookstore pool, 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 castle, beach, beach train, station, train station, cafe, bakery. And we'd spread them out again and do it faster. <laughs> spread them out one more time. We're going to do it a different way. <laughs> There are a million variations of this. A good set of pictures goes a long way and when you're learning vocabulary because it avoids the use of translation. Now this time, because we've been working on these for a lot longer, you know, some of you even have to spread them out in perfect rows. This is really, really sad, guys. Okay, so I'm going to circumlocute this time, much as I did with the Italian, where you go to pray. But I might have to say, où vous allez pour prier? I might have to be gesturing at the same time. Où vous allez pour nager? Où vous allez pour nager? Nager à l'extérieur. Nager à l'extérieur. OK, and you, so you would circumlocute, so it's just got harder. For those that languages where you can write, they can write their circumlocution definitions, and then you use theirs. So there's a lot that you can do. Now, one more game. You and your partner are using the same set. And I'm just going to say a circumlocution, a little like slapjack, or use pencils so they don't hit each other's hands, depending on how violent they are. Look at one set, just decide which set you're looking at. And they'll be the first person to touch the picture that wins it. Understand what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Oh, j'ai faim. J'ai faim. Un café. Un café, j'ai faim. And whoever touched café first picks it up. And then you go through and see who, you know, it's just like matching. Um, who has the most pictures at the end? You do not take points. You do not compete. You say, ah, qui a gagné? Who won? Gloire et honneur. We're finished. Glory and honor. We're not competing for points or prizes or candy. Because when you compete, the person that doesn't win doesn't feel good. And you never want to create negative emotion in your class. Now, we're really advanced now. And I'm not going to have time to do this, but we're going to get up in an inner outer circle and we're going to have a conversation. This is what I want you to do. Really and truly, when this shows up on camera, I'm not going to like it. So each of you pick up two pictures. Don't show your partner. And I'm going to come out here and use the two of you. I'm going to be looking at your pictures. Because yesterday's workshop, they said, well, how do you give all the directions? Are you giving the directions in English? No. If your directions are so complicated for the activity you're going to do, do a different activity. That's just the bottom line. OK, so you have your two pictures in your hand. You don't even have to stand up. If you'll just face each other for a second, I just want to see yours. So what I want them to do, you see if you can figure it out by what I'm going to do right now, OK? Ah. 
Est-ce que est-ce qu'il y a il y a une il y a un uh, café un café non pas de café pas de café mm. est-ce qu'il y a une plage il y a une plage non mm. pas de plage pas de plage mm. est-ce qu'il y a une um, est-ce qu'il y a un château un château non pas de château un train un train pour voir ah and back what am i asking them to do did you understand my directions yes. by my modeling yes. so see you can do it it's just that when that shows up on camera it's going to look a little silly <laughs> so that's your moment of being an actor or actress If you can't get it across that way with a couple of students maybe coming up in front of the room so everybody can see, you're really not going to be able to do the activity well. So think through. Lots and lots of uses of pictures. So let's keep going with this lesson. And um, uh, now it's time to read. Now, in Chinese, I give it to you. It's really hard to read authentic Chinese. <laughs> But because you have root words, you might only be able to call attention to which words do you think talk about places in a city by the root. So you start to build that. So this has a lot of words in it. Here's the English translation. Just so you know, it's really just naming the types of restaurants, talking about whether there's a beach or not. I design an activity that makes administrators very happy because this is evidence. So in early language, literacy, proof, it's called a proof for, proof against. The directions are here if you need to read them later. The first one, Chloe is 18 years old. So they get this from me with the French only. They get this text and they read silently. And they're looking for evidence. Is Chloe 18 or not? If they find proof that she is 18, they write the French words here. If they find proof against, they write the French words there. And they might have only written 43. But what that is, is it's textual evidence, which is common core. So even at the lowest levels, what is your textual evidence for something? I want you to see what happens when we translate or get to, our questions are too specific. Notice this expression, Angers is near the sea, près de la mer. If I'm a typical language student and I have to find out about près de la mer, this is what I start doing. I'm looking for près de la mer. Hmm, I found mer. Oh darn, I guess I have to understand this to figure it out. But if I'd actually use the exact same words or characters that are in the text, it's really just hunt and peck matching. So you've got to be a little bit careful about what you write. So it is a way. And then the next time we might build on this reading, these are images. Are they in the reading or not? So I did it with a video, and now I'm doing it with a text but it's sort of adding images, blah, 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 blah. At some point where I say, that's enough of class, we're ready to go, I have to find out, do you know it? So one check for learning was what I demonstrated earlier, because I can walk around and listen as she's saying, do you have, is there a, there is not. That's just one simple check for learning. I stop teaching, I put them in pairs, I listen. The other is end of class, if it's Chinese, let's just say it's Chinese, they can't write, they can't write for a minute, everything they know about Angers, but they should be able to talk about Angers. So they might have to take out their cell phones and record what they can say. And the directions would be talk for one minute. If you run out of things to say, start over. That's really important because what happens is if I say, talk for one minute, she'll talk for 20 seconds and I'll be walking around and she will not be doing any Chinese or whatever language anymore. And when she looks at me, she'll say, what will she say? I'm finished. I'm finished. No, she can't. I said, 
for one minute, and if you run out of things to say, start over. Write, if you're in a language where they can write, or heritage, they have more language, write for a minute. Write for two minutes, but if you run out of things to say, start over, keep writing. So that way they can see that they write more over time. And you pick it up as they leave the class, and you can see that tomorrow, you better go help her. Because her exit slip had hardly anything on it, or the recording she submitted was nothing other than a couple of words. She needs more help tomorrow. Or worst case scenario, 75% of the class didn't do very well, and you have a serious message. They did not learn what you taught. Something went wrong, and if it's 75% didn't get it, it's not them, it's you. So exit slips, those types of things are really good for doing that. Let's do one more quick, simple lesson about, um, I was working with the Wayan program and their theme was Water, Water Everywhere. So they do a content, more of a content-based unit. Do any of you do content-based units, STEM units? Anybody? Okay, so this is more of a STEM unit. A lot of our heritage programs are a little bit more of a STEM concept, still very novice. I want you to learn facts about sea turtles. Are they going to go out in the streets of Beijing and talk about sea turtles? Really? Do you think I'm going out on Denver this afternoon and having a conversation with anybody out there about sea turtles? So it's not that they're going to use it on the streets of Denver, but I'm also teaching on another, on a parallel level, do you like? Do you like sea turtles? Do you like um, starfish? Do you like? So that they're learning the vocabulary both in a fact-based approach and in, oh, I can use do you like with a lot of different things. So I'm combining language and content. So I am teaching this one in French. I'm going to follow my own. I'm going to hook you in. But by the end of the lesson, the goal is that you all individually will be able to say one or two sentences, two or three sentences, five sentences, this depends on the proficiency level of your learners, about sea turtles. These are some sample sentences we'll be working on. I need to hook you in. I have the perfect hook for a day when snow is forecast in Denver. We are going to go to the tropical islands because I've got to make you interested in sea turtles. How many of you have a natural interest in sea turtles in this room? Please raise your hand if you woke up this morning thinking about sea turtles. <laughs> now, if you're going to be a marine biologist, you might have. I might have hit you. And I'm going to have to hook you in. So let me show you just a brief video. Couldn't find a Chinese sea turtle. They exist. And you don't need any narration with this, but we'll give you a little music for mood. Is there anybody that's saying, oh, this is really bad? Well, isn't everybody starting to think, oh, I even heard a couple people say, oh, so cute. I mean, so what have I done? I've captured your imagination. I've taken you to the tropics. I might start with language you already have. Do you like to swim? Do you prefer the ocean or the swimming pool? And then start talking about sea turtles, so that activation of prior knowledge, sorry, we have to come back to Denver where it's going to snow. We could do parts of the body if we had done that. So there's a lot you bring in that they already know. But now I'm going to French, but I'm going to ask you what you understand on each set of slides. Ready? And if you speak French, don't volunteer. Où tu habites la tortue de mer? Où tu habites la tortue de mer? Où tu habites, habites la tortue de mer? La tortue de mer, j'habite l'océan. J'habite l'océan. J'habite le fleuve jaune? Oui? Non. Non. J'habite, j'habite, j'habite l'océan. J'habite l'océan. Somebody that doesn't speak French at all, what's the question? Où tu habites la tortue de mer? Où tu habites? What's your best guess? Where do turtles live? Where do you? Turtles live. Where do you live? Où tu habites la tortue de mer? Tu habites l'océan? Où tu habites le fleuve jaune? So I can, uh, we're going to do a couple more, you're going to get better, but this is going to be the pattern question. Où 
tu habites la tortue de mer? Où tu habites la tortue de mer? What's the difference between this slide and this slide? The vocabulary is gone. Because if I keep working where the words are, I don't know if you've learned anything or if you're reading it to me. So not until I get here and I can call on students and say, la tortue de mer, où tu habites la tortue de mer? J'habite l'océan, je n'habite pas le fleuve jaune. Without seeing any words, am I sure you're starting to learn? So let's do a couple more. Qu'est-ce que tu fais, la tortue de mer? Qu'est-ce que tu fais, la tortue de mer? Je nage dans l'océan. Je nage dans l'océan. Et aussi, je marche. Je marche sur la plage. Vous comprenez? La question, qu'est-ce que tu fais, la tortue de mer? Je nage, je nage et je marche. And what's that question asking? Qu'est-ce que tu fais, la tortue de mer? Now, I would not be translating in class, and I want to prove to you is you can understand a whole lot with visuals and actions. So what do you think the question is asking? Qu'est-ce que tu fais, je nage? Qu'est-ce que tu fais, je nage? What do you think? Does Turkey swim or not? Okay, so qu one question was, does she swim? Does the turtle swim? Qu'est-ce que tu fais? Je nage. Qu'est-ce que tu fais? Je nage. I swim. Je marche. Je marche. I walk. Je nage. So the question is, is what do you do? But what was my learning goal today? Is it anything about the question? No. Remember what my learning goal was? That you can say two or three things about sea turtles. I'm still using the questions. Why wouldn't I? Because that's just starting to build towards comprehension on both sides. So I'm interested because, um, because you're using the, the, the question and answer format rather than talking about the turtle in the third person. Okay, so, and this is really interesting. If I talk about the turtle in the third person in French, yeah. the um, grammar becomes more complex. Exactly. Well, that's what I was If noticing. I talk about the turtle in, in first person or third person in Chinese, no change, right? Yeah. So by language, you have to make decisions. But this also, I mean, it also is closer to... You become a turtle? Well, well, yeah, and you also are learning to, di you know, you're learning to dialogue. You're learning a way of... Right, so right. that's why I'm setting up a more right. useful pattern out right. there on the streets of Beijing by staying with do you, I. Because yeah. we really rarely talk third person when we're novice learners. I can barely talk about myself. I still don't start talking about he and she. We sometimes force it, but it's not natural at all. That's called gossiping. <laughs> <laughs> we actually try to discourage gossiping, except when we want to teach verb forms. And then we encourage it. So I'll hear a couple more. Qu'est-ce que tu manges? Qu'est-ce que tu manges? I bet you already know what manges. Yeah, why? What symbol did I add? The fork. <coughs> the fork and the knife. So there you go. An extra visual and you've got it. Qu'est-ce que tu manges? Oh, je mange des plantes. Des plantes et des méduses. Ooh. Je n'aime pas les méduses. Les méduses dans l'océan. Ooh. Ooh. Non, non, non. Les méduses. Mais la tortue? La tortue adore les méduses. What's a méduse? Jellyfish. Jellyfish. Mm -hmm. And we keep going. Tu es grand. Ou petite. Tu es grande ou petite? Je suis, what symbol am I using for that? Je suis, I equal, I am. Je suis grand, je suis petite. You want to make them go, oh, oh. Just go get a short video of those turtles crawling to the sea when they're babies. I mean, seriously, you can do a whole lot with cute video that has no sound. Okay. Ah, qu'est-ce que tu préfères? Qu'est-ce que tu préfères? Je préfère l'eau propre. Je préfère l'eau propre. Je déteste les sacs plastiques. What just happened in your brain? What did you start thinking about with these images? What issue came to mind? Pollution. Pollution. So when somebody says, I cannot do higher order thinking at the novice level, you can provoke higher order thinking. They might not be able to talk about it yet, but you can provoke it. And watch what happens next. 
Je préfère le propre. Je déteste les sacs plastiques. Quel est le problème? Remember 21st century skills, critical thinking and problem solving? Quel est le problème? What's the problem? J'ai faim. Oh là là, j'ai faim. J'ai vraiment faim. Regarde, beaucoup de méduses délicieuses. Les plantes, les méduses, j'ai faim. Beaucoup de méduses délicieuses. Oh, méduses ou sac plastique? Sac plastique. Méduses ou sac plastique? Now, what is your brain saying to yourself right now, even though you can't say it in French? What did you just realize? They look like jellyfish. <laughs> that floating plastic bags look a lot like jellyfish. So now I can get really dramatic. J'ai faim, j'avance, je mange. Un sac plastique et je suis moi. C'est le problème. So I can activate higher order thinking on the most basic <coughs> concepts if I plan for it and provoke it in the brain. So we can really do a lot more at novice than we sometimes don't. Okay, so here's your test. Remember, I have to make sure you have learned to say a couple of sentences about the, about the jellyfish, and you cannot read them. So what I've done is all these images I've put up, I have captured here in Reba's sentences, something we all use, the sea turtle, but we'll just say I. That's how we were practicing it, I. Here are all your verbs. You can help each other for a minute to think of some sentences. And here are some of your concept words to complete a sentence. So here are my directions. You are going to have a numbered heads together activity. And you will be numbering off one, two, three, four at your tables. Okay, just give yourselves a number. It's okay to talk about this. One, two, three, four, very quickly. Don't go over four. Don't go over four, because you never should have a group more than four. Please raise your hand if you're a number one. All tables should have a number one. Please raise your hand if you're a number two, three, four. And some tables have another number one, right? Because you guys have five, so you've resolved that. On a seating chart, I would mark down your number because darn if you won't switch numbers on me and I can't remember. Make sure that everyone at your table has a different sentence to say. Okay, practice real quickly. We don't have much time. As, okay, that's enough time. Turtle. You all are at the genius yeah. level. <laughs> Oh, I, I am the now way. assigning a number numbers. to your okay. table. Number, you are table number one, you are table number two, you are table number three, four, five, six, and table number seven. I couldn't count. Math has never been my strong suit. Okay, so I have my seven cards. Table one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Ready? We're going to pick the table that's going to perform for the group. It's called in French. Choisissez la victime, which translates as to pick the victim. I was not the mean person, she was. Table number two, I do have to hear a sentence from all of you. They have a one, two, three, four, correct? Watch what we're going to do just to keep them honest. Choisissez une autre victime. And would number two start? Who was your number two? You'll do the first sentence and then we'll go around. Go ahead. Well, I don't want to say her sentence. She is said it. And no, no, no. Make sure okay. the directions were yeah. make sure everyone at your table has a different sentence to say. Would you all like to practice for one more 30 seconds? Is it the turtle? The test sac plastic. Okay, so let's hear the sentences from this table. Do you mind saying it again? And you can say it in English. The sea turtle hates plastic bags. The sea turtle hates plastic bags. Your sentence, please. Sea turtles love clean water. The sea turtles love clean water. Your sentence, please. Sea turtle lives in uh, ocean. Sea turtle lives in the ocean. Sea turtle likes jellyfish to eat. OK, and so give them a round of applause. I would go pick another group. Another group would do it, and then the rest of you would be off the hook. 
But what I'm doing is I can't necessarily call on every student in my class, but I can let everyone practice and they don't know who's going to perform at the end. There's some randomness to it. So as you walk out, I have a sense that most of you could say the sentences. So we're almost at the end, but I think you had a question. Oh, I just want to ask whether we need to use in English or oh, French. I, I mean, obviously, if this were a class, we would have done French, mm -hmm. but I wouldn't have covered five slides in 30 seconds, basically. You would have been able to do it. Yeah, you can't do that until you've prepared them to do it. So we're right at the end, and I just want to put this one last slide up. Please convey to your teachers, those of you are, that are trainers and lead instructors, I wrote this lesson plan. I worked on it. The odds of me teaching it as written are slim to none. Because once I have a good idea of where I want to go, I knew stage one and stage two. But in the middle of that lesson, I may realize I'm not going to get it all done today. I need another practice activity. Um, they're not ready to move on. Teachers need to know that a plan is just that. Plans can be changed. The more organized you are, the easier it is to change plans thinking on your feet. But mostly our new newer teachers need to know that even as a veteran teacher, I never really taught a plan the way I wrote it. Because that's not thinking about differentiation. It's not being prepared to meet the needs of the learner. So thank you very much. And if you have any questions, I'll stay. And um, thank you to the stars in the audience who are now on film and will live forevermore on the Star Talk website.